All right, we're going to continue in our equip seminar on skills for biblical interpretation. Uh, we've been laying some of the groundwork. Now we're going to jump into more of the practical side of things. So today we're moving on to our reference or study Bible. How many people have a reference or study Bible? A few? Okay. All right, so I'm going to teach you how to use a reference or study Bible by looking at a few different examples. I'd really encourage you to find one, uh, if you don't have one, uh, that uh, it can help you dig in deeper into the passages that you're reading and help you see uh, uh, ties between scriptures that you might not have realized before. So study Bibles, though, are not considered translations. They are distinct. You can have an ESV Bible, or you could have an ESV study Bible. So a study Bible is not a translation. It's more of a tool. Remember how I said that we can't rely um, on people or commentaries too much? I've kind of stressed that over the last couple of times we've done this. Well, the same thing applies here. When we use this tool of a study Bible, we can't always uh, rely on it too much, and we'll, we'll talk about why. But study Bibles are tools to help us dive into the Bible even more. But the use of one tool will not help with every project, especially when a, a screwdriver uh, should be used instead of a hammer. And sometimes my screwdriver won't get the same do job done that a different screwdriver will, right? And so a study Bible is a great start, and it'll give us a, a ton of insight that we may not have had before, but there are still even other tools that we can use too. We'll talk about that next week. Anyway, so a reference or a study Bible contains biographical information, uh, geographic information. Uh, it'll have cross citations, doctrinal information, theological information, and many other types of, of uh, information that helps enhance what you're reading. This, there is a good list, a, a list of good study Bibles on page, I think it's 43 of your handout. It's not an exhaustive list, but if, uh, if you're looking for a list, I think it's there. Now, a good rule of thumb, if you can trust the translation, you'll more likely than trust the study Bible they offer. But here's some helpful hints. First, don't be afraid to write in the Bible. Uh, the book of Lamentations in my uh, study Bible here, let me just quick show you what it looks like. So when I'm studying, was studying through Lamentations, this is a few years ago, and I'm underlining and I'm writing in references and, and things like that, don't be afraid to write in your Bible, okay? Because it's going to help you come back and think of just different things that uh, maybe you just didn't have insight in before. I also like to write uh, prayers down in my Bible too, especially as, they're, uh, um, as they come to me while I'm, I'm studying the Bible, okay? Now, nothing I write in the Bible ever becomes, you know, scripture, so, you know, I should make that, that caveat too, but. All right, so don't be afraid to do that. Um, and compare scripture with scripture. I think this is the most important thing. If I can teach you anything, compare scripture with scripture. Allow the Bible to teach the Bible. And we're going to look at an example of that here. Um, let's look at these scriptures. So if you have a Bible, go to Lamentations chapter 3 for a moment. Lamentations chapter 3. I'm digging into something that usually most, most pastors don't dig into, but this is, a, this is a helpful, quick study. So Lamentations chapter 3, we're going to look at verse 8 here for a moment. It says this, Even when I call out or cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. Even when I call out or cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. Go to verse 44 of this same chapter. Chapter 3, verse 44. 
It says, you have covered yourself with a cloud so that no prayer can get through. I'll say that again. You have covered yourself with a cloud so that no prayer can get through. Now jump to Isaiah chapter 1. I encourage you in the, uh, in the meantime, we're doing just a quick study here. Always read the entire context of these verses. I'm just, we're just highlighting a verse right now, but I'd encourage you to go back and look at the whole context. Isaiah 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse 15. This is God speaking. He says, When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Now go to Psalm 18, 41. Psalm 18, 41. It says, They cried for help, but there was no one to save them. To the Lord, but he did not answer. I'll read it again, Psalm 18, verse 41. They cried for help, but there was no one to save them. To the Lord, but he did not answer. And finally, chapter 28, Psalm 28, verse 1. Twenty-eight, verse 1, it says, To you I call, O Lord, my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me, for if you remain silent, I will be like those who have gone down to the pit. One more time. To you I call, O Lord, my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me, for if you remain silent, I will be like those who have gone down to the pit. So here we have one, two, three, four, five scriptures. And it's talking about something that we don't tend to highlight when the times when God doesn't answer prayer or wouldn't even listen to them, okay? And the context, again, I always uh, encourage to go read the whole chapter of everything that we just read, okay? But the context of this is that when God doesn't listen to prayer, when God doesn't answer prayer, it is in the times when the person has been uh, very sinful, has continued in their sin, has ignored God, and finally when they do turn around, even um, they, uh, even when they're asking sometimes for prayer, they're still not really wanting God's help. They want to be justified almost in their sin. So, again, I'd encourage you to go back and read through it. But this is just to highlight an example of Scripture teaching Scripture, okay? You go into Scripture, you read what it says, and then we, we, um, make our beliefs to align with that, right? That's, that's what we are called to do as believers. Instead of reading our views into Scripture, we are to read Scripture and learn from it and change our views around it. So become familiar with a variety of aids in the reference Bible. In other words, know how to use it, know how to use different tools, and for a third time, and you know, again, a warning, always make sure that you're double-checking what you're using and what you're reading, okay? Especially your theologians. Make sure you know who you're listening to. But all right, let's, uh, let's start looking at a few examples of a study Bible. And first example is going to be the Disciples Study Bible, the NIV edition. And this is in your, your handout. Um, but if again, if you have your study Bible with you, I encourage you to take it out. If you haven't used it before and you're trying to start getting used to it, take it out to see where the things are the same that I'm showing you or where things are different. So uh, the first thing we're going to see, and I know that this is small print, so I'm going to try to just highlight what I'm highlighting to you. In the middle, there is a column. Can you see my laser pointer pretty well? Okay. So this column right here is cross-references, okay? And quite a few reference Bibles have this feature, okay? A cross-reference. It'll take something from the uh, chapter that you're reading, and it'll have, for example, this has a little letter right there that, ta that, is, that is referenced in here. And so that cross-references other scriptures that tie into this passage. It also has alphabetic notes. It also has uh, 
uh, chapter number, which is pretty standard in any Bible. It has a chapter title, which is pretty standard in any Bible. It has a principal passage, so the, the Disciple Study Bible has resources in it where it will discuss the theology of the passage in the footnotes. This is one of, this one is, um, points to two different spots. Uh, one is lower on this page and the other one is uh, in Deuteronomy. Also, there is an extension of the cross-reference. This Bible study couldn't, uh, this Bible, uh, study Bible, sorry, couldn't fit everything in the whole column here, and so they just continued it right down here uh, to fit everything that it was cross-referencing. And then it also has alternate translations of words or phrases or verses. So the difference between uh, the whole mountain in this case or all the people. Um, that it's trying to kind of elucidate what's going on in that passage. And then this also has an all caps section. This study Bible contains in its footnotes down here. This one says Revelation, okay? Uh, uh, it has a discussion of 27 major doctrines as outlined by the Bible. So this includes Revelation, uh, God, and I think Revelation it means by like be God revealing himself to us, not necessarily Revelation end times because I think that it says end times for that. But revelation, God, sin, humanity, salvation, and so on. So if the scripture somehow ties into one of these 27 major topics, uh, it'll discuss it there in the footnotes. And then the lowercase part of these major doctrines discuss the subtopics under the major doctrine. So on this page, we see uh, revelation slash messengers and revelation slash commitment. Let's go to a different study Bible. This one is the Liberty Annotated Study Bible, the KJV edition. So again, you're going to see in the middle column the cross-references, because that's the same thing that's happening in this study Bible. Again, it's pretty standard in most Bibles. This one operates as the same as the last one we saw. It again has a chapter number. It again has a chapter title. And this study Bible includes a subsection within the chapter outline. It helps us to remember what is talked about a little bit better. Now, my study Bible that I showed you just a second ago does the same thing. So, for example, when Matthew is talking with the Sermon on the Mount, when I'm trying to find a verse about adultery, and I'm pretty sure it's in the Sermon on the Mount section, I can quickly scan the, the subsection title to find it. This Bible also has a general commentary. Most study Bibles have this, mainly talking about the passage and some general understandings from it. This should cause us to consider uh, what they're saying, new insights, and, and to study further. And then this one has a key biblical understanding, somewhat like the previous uh, example from the Disciples uh, Study Bible. This section in this study Bible highlights a major topic in the Bible and then discusses it, okay? Sometimes it lines up with the general commentary in the study Bible, and sometimes it doesn't. This Bible also has an important biblical figure. So this study Bible helps us to understand uh, the figure in the passage and gives us some surrounding info about them. And it gives us some archaeological relevance. This study Bible gives some surrounding archaeological evidence that helps verify the history of what happened and puts the passage into a geographical and historical context. So. There's some similarities between the two. There's some differences between the two. There's definitely some similarities and differences between my study Bible and I'm sure yours as well. Here's just a few more additional elements of the Liberty Annotated Study Bible. Again, the center cross-reference column operates the same as the last example. It lists the verse, and if there were more chapters on this page than just one, it would give the chapter and verse uh, that the small letter is found in in the cross-reference which we see here, okay? Let's look up, uh, go to Revelation 21, verse 4. Revelation 21, verse 4.
All right. So this is what it says. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Okay? So keep your finger right there. Up here, they're referencing... This is Matthew chapter 5. In verse 4, it says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And they said, hey, here's the, another reference to mourning and comfort in Revelation 21 verse 4. And so they attach that there. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Go look at Revelation 21 verse 4. It says, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Now, realize that the people who put this study Bible together, they made a choice to put these two verses together. And I can see the connection, right? We, we are mourning now, but one day we won't be. But we also have to decide this. Do these verses actually inform one another? Do they answer one another? Is it valid to connect these two verses together? Okay? And the reason I say that is because um, them putting those two verses together was still more of a human decision. Okay? And we have to question whether or not that was the right decision to make. It depends on the context, such as sitting with people in mourning or learning about hope. And what I'm saying is this. It's for the fourth time. Be careful not to just drink the Kool-Aid of whoever you are listening to. And I, real I hope you realize that applies to myself as well. Always check everything against the Bible and, and discern whether or not what they're saying and what they're connecting is valid or true, okay? This was passed down to me by my parents. They always told me to test what they say against the Bible. If it falls through, let them know so that they can correct what they say. I want to do the same thing. If, if I say something that is against the Bible or doesn't, doesn't line up with the Bible, I want to know so that I can correct it. And so I can correct it for, you know, every, we had like 150 people this, this morning. Um, I don't want to lead everyone astray, right? So it's important for you to let me know so I can let other people know. All right, in this Bible, it places uh, the alternate words, phrases, etc., in the center column. So when we look at the Disciples Study Bible, it placed this info below the text, same info is being included, but they're just putting it in a different spot. And again, here is some general commentary, broken down by verse, and this study Bible also includes a map of Galilee uh, with significant locations and travels of Jesus. This, help, this helps us visualize where he has gone. All right, so in the center column, Sometimes equivalence translations are given. So here we see what happens in Matthew chapter 26, verse 15. And they connect that to Zechariah 11, verse 12. So in Matthew 26, it's um, talking about... Uh, um, let me see where it is. He said unto them, What will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. And so they go to Zechariah 11, verse 12, where that's prophesied that that will happen. And so they give you that connection right away. Here is a note. I'm oh, sorry. Here, so that's that connection point with Zechariah 11. Here is a note on, about the literal translation that gives us the exact meaning of the Greek. So master literally means teacher. And this is highlighted again here in a language note. This is letting us know that the word master, again, literally means teacher. And then the square brackets in this part of the center column shows a similar concept for this passage. It's found elsewhere in the Bible. In this case, this is my body concept can be found in 1 Peter 2.24. Now, earlier I talked about how different words can have different meanings and how some translations give word for word, and sometimes they give thought for thought translations. So here we have an alternate translation note where we see that the translators chose to use the word palms instead of rods because probably they thought it would fit the context better. 
So it says, smote them with the palms of their hands. The literal word would be rods. They smote him with the rods of their hands. So it might sound silly at first, but the writers may have been attempting to say fists uh, instead of rods, and they didn't have the word for fists in their language as we would consider fists. So these are the types of things that we have to consider when we are introduced to this information. Uh, it gives an explanatory note to help us understand a word that is used. And this note is trying to take the ambiguity out of the word swear. We could think, oh my, what a potty mouth. Because of this, the translators want us to make sure we know what is meant by the word swear. All right, let's just take a little break from all that and have a little levity. I'm going to play a little video here. It's from the skit guys, okay? And it's, it should highlight the importance of truly reading our Bible and not just trying to... Um, uh, skirt by. So enjoy this. Hey, Graham turned up just a little bit. I think I have a pretty good grasp of the Bible and uh, how I teach it to my Sunday school class. Granted, I've been asked to step down a few times, but I mean, heresy is such a loose term these days. But I think if you put all the jigsaw pieces of the puzzle of the Bible together, I think I have a pretty good idea to teach anybody a little thing or two. Okay, so uh, share some of your knowledge with us. Okay, no problem on that one. Um, the Bible really doesn't get cooking until Moses built the ark. And the, wait, no, um, no, he was the one that parted the Red Sea. He was also the one that wrestled with God in the river of Gabok. And if it wasn't for that, he wouldn't have been able to part that river too. But that was a foreshadowing. That was a prophecy for the New Testament when Luke would be in that river going, hey, I thought I could walk on water. And that was a foreshadowing of King Nebuchadnezzar telling King David, go get those people out of that water because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do not belong there. And that is how King James became the greatest king of Israel. I believe in putting the words into action. You know what I mean? I mean, it's one thing to talk the talk. It's another one to walk the walk. All right? Case in point. I taught my kids the other day about David and Goliath, right? Now my youngest son, he's got mad skills with a slingshot. You know, I, I could tell you several stories of us, you know, putting the word into action. Uh, one of the most recent ones is I told my boys about, you know, Joseph and his brothers. And my oldest son, my oldest son, Tried to sell his brother to the next door neighbor for a coat. My little entrepreneur, Bob was proud. And it was a nice coat. I'm a big fan of the Bible. I mean, who wouldn't be? It's in most hotel chains. I have one, probably two. I know I have a non reading one in our living room. It's beautiful. It's right underneath our plaque that says, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm such a fan, I became a fan of the Bible on Facebook. Big fan. So, um, how often do you read the Bible? I'm a big fan. I don't see what the big deal is about, you know, memorizing scripture or carrying a big old clunky Bible everywhere. I mean, I have multiple translations of the Bible right here on my phone and on my digital reader, you know? And when I get to church, it's up on the screens. I don't really need to carry, I mean, carrying a big Bible anymore is just passe. Don't you think that having your own Bible helps you plant God's Word inside your heart? Really? So like, you know, thy word is a, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path? You talking like Psalm 119, 113? I'm sorry, I, I guess you do know quite a bit of scripture on your own then. Nope. Just Google it. This is my grandmother's Bible. She used to read to me out of this Bible when I was just a kid. She passed away this summer. A family member gave it to me because they knew I was a believer. To them, it was just a book. But to me, when I sit down and I read it, I see all her little notes. I see all the little highlighted pages, the dog-eared pages. I see the things that really meant something to her when God was speaking to her through his word. And I realize it's her legacy of faith that's passed on to me. That was passed from her parents to her. And you know what? It impacts my faith. 
more than anything, this truly is the living word. All right, so let's go on. I uh, figured we could use a little break. I know the stuff that we've been talking about is a little, it's on the practical side, um, so it can be a little bit drier. That a little break would be nice. One last example of a reference Bible is the NASB reference edition. It's found on page uh, 54, I think, of your handout. Um, and that's, if I got it right. But first we see here the uh, uh, page number. And the book, the chapter, section title, the chapter number. And here we see a word italicized so that it's easier to read. Again, sometimes word-for-word -word translations can come into the English language a little chunky, uh, clunky, sorry. Just like when we try to speak someone else's language, we can be a little clunky too. And this reference Bible has a, a star next to a word. Right there by verse 4 of John chapter 3, Nicodemus said to him. Uh, other Bibles, it could be an asterisk, but it's where a word was changed from the present to the past tense. So here, if I would read this as if I was telling you a story, I would say, So Nicodemus says to him, How can a man be bored when he is old? In the Greek, that's how it's put together. Nicodemus says to him, How can a man be bored when he is old? So the translators changed that to a past tense word. Nicodemus said to him. And they just want to let you know that they did that and why. Many versions uh, put the words of Jesus in red, even if it's not a study Bible. There's, that's pretty well known. And just like the last few examples, the center column gives a literal, an equivalent, and alternate translations, as well as language notes and cross-references. Anytime a word in this version refers to the Trinity, it is capitalized. That's not always the case in the original languages. Now, in the back of the Bible, how many people in the back of your Bible, doesn't even have to be a study Bible, have a concordance? You usually have a pretty, yeah, pretty, pretty, at least simple one there. So most references or study Bibles, there will be a concordance in the back. Even for just a quote-unquote regular Bible, there will be the, that too. These are helpful for an, an initial uh, starting point when studying words or themes. So for example, if we came across the word choked, we may want to look it up and see where else it is used. So in Luke chapter 8, verse 14, it is used. And this... Uh, this concordance gives us the context which it is used in. Now, if we look up the word choose, we'll find a different form of the word in Second Timothy, sorry, Second Peter 1, verse 10, as choosing, again, with its context. So we have different forms of words in the, in the concordance. And below that, we find another word for the uh, form of the word, uh, chosen. And next to it, some words that it could mean because uh, that's not a one-to-one -one equation when translating words. Other places the word uh, chosen is used. And then lastly, the concordance can give us some important details on words. For example, the word Christian. So in this version here, we learn uh, <coughs> why there's only a few references to the word Christian in the Bible. It was first used in Acts and then only sparingly used afterward. In the Disciples Study Bible, our first example that we looked at today, the concordance can give us some biographical info as well as scriptural references when it's talking about people such as uh, Apollos. Other helpful listings such as apostles, where it not only gives us the word it is used, but um, who, uh, who are considered apostles. And then finally, the uh, concordance can give us different forms of the word. Now notice that in the concordance here, only the first letter is given than the actual verse. 
uh, a way to save space. Now, knowing how to use your study Bible will help you to discern how the Bible can teach the Bible. And I hope at the very least, if you don't have a study Bible, this might encourage you to go grab one. Um, the three versions I talked about, or if you look in your um, packet, you can see ones that you can use. Um, but it'll help you, again, learn how to allow the Bible to teach the Bible. We've talked about cross-reference uh, center columns, uh, so let's just put it to use a little bit. We're going to look at 1 Peter 4, verse 17. This is what it says. For it, is, for it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? So that's 1 Peter 4, 17. We're going to look at the phrase, the household of God. We should notice that there is a little B right next to that phrase, uh, which we remember directs us to the center column, which I have exploded, so it's pretty, pretty big, um, to look at what that little B is. So this Bible is telling us to look at three other scriptures that are connected to this phrase, specifically uh, 1 Timothy 3.15, Hebrews 3, verse 6, and 1 Peter 2, verse 5. So thus, if we go to those, I'm just going to kind of jump forward a few steps, and then we're going to practice this. Uh, thus, if we go to those three scriptures and read them and record them, it'll look something like this. So there's 1 Timothy 3.15, there's Hebrews 3.6, and there's 1 Peter 2.5. Looking at the household of God, 1 Timothy 3.15 says, Household is the church of the living God, which is the pillar and support of truth. Hebrews 3.6, Christ is a faithful son over his house, whose house we are. And 1 Peter 2.5, we are a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices. So that is the first level that we were told to go look at. Well, if you would go to each of these, these all have cross-references too. And so 1 Timothy 3.15 said to go look at Ephesians 2.21, 1 Corinthians 3.16, and 2 Corinthians 6.16. And so those are recorded here. Hebrews 3.6 said to go look at Hebrews 1.2. And 1 Peter 2.5 said to go look at Galatians 6.10. So this is our second level of cross-references. And then out of those, they even had cross-references. Ephesians 2.21 said to go look at Ephesians 4.15 and so on. And there's a couple more there for other cross-references. So all that to say, you start with one passage and pretty soon you're kind of expanding out and looking at more of the Bible, specifically on uh, how these things tie into the household of God. So from doing all of, oh, go ahead, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. And so like I said, for study Bibles, it is the people who are putting it together, they're making that choice, saying, hey, this verse seems to connect to this verse, okay? And so our due diligence is to go look at it and decide whether or not that's a good connection to make, right? Um, and sometimes they'll connect it to different verses than other people will connect it to, okay? Again, this should help you to get into the Bible more and study it more, but not necessarily um, just agree with everything that the study Bible is saying. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, yeah, so it has different references, I'm sure. Yep. Yeah, so from doing all of this in this example, we would learn that the Bible teaches us that the household of God is the church of the living God with Christ as the cornerstone of the building that is fitted together by the Holy Spirit. The members of the household of God are priests of the temple that is in us through the Holy Spirit. Thus, God's household has Christ dwelling in the believer through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So again, if we start just tracing through the Bible, and I'm sure even if it has different references, it'll start circulating and you'll start seeing some of the, the references too. 
This is how the Bible can teach the Bible. It can start opening your eyes. And once you start becoming more familiar with the Bible, then you'll start saying, hey, I read this in, in you know, Revelation, and I'm pretty sure I read this in, let's say, Deuteronomy. So you'll start flipping through and looking at Deuteronomy and start seeing those connections too, just by your own memory of it. But let's just take a moment to practice, okay? Um, look at Luke 15. Go to Luke 15. I'm going to read verses 1 to 7, but we're going to practice this specifically for verse 4. Luke 15. I'm going to read verses 1 to 7. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after, excuse me, and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. All right, so let's focus in on verse, verse 4 specifically. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Now, if you have a Bible that has references in it, uh, are there any references that is connected to verse 4? Does it say, go check out this other scripture? And I'll write them down here. Okay, so I'm just going to write down Matthew 18, 12 to 14 for now. Matthew, you said? All right, let's put down Matthew 3, 7. And again, whether or not these actually connect, we'll find out in a second. Matthew 3, verse 7. Do we have at least one more? Yeah. Okay. Sure. First Peter 2, 25. All right, so all we're going to do now, our, our study Bible said, hey, you should check these out. We think they're connected. Now again, if I can write a five. Again, I always say let's be discerning on, on whether or not they are connected, okay? So let's look at each of them. Let's look at Matthew 18, 12 to 14. Matthew 18, 12 to 14. And this is what it says. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about the one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, our Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones be lost. So does that connect? Yeah, easily connects, right? So now if we looked at uh, specifically verse 12 of chapter 18, that's about the most similar to verse 4 that we were looking at. Do you see any cross-references specifically on verse 12? This is for our second level. Yeah, for me, it sends, mine sends me back to Luke as well. See, so sometimes you'll just kind of get into a little circle, and you're like, okay, I'm done. That one's good. <laughs> All right, let's go on to the next one. Matthew 3. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Phil. Yeah? Yep, yep. Okay, so let's go to Matthew 3 now, verse 7. Matthew 3, 7.
And this is what it says, Matthew 3, 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the ra coming wrath? Now that one's a little bit harder. wonder how that one would connect. I'm thinking. Yeah, I don't know how that one would connect to myself. But again, if you see it that then, you can be like, okay, I don't know why they're connecting these two verses together. And maybe we can go to a, a, another, um, a second level reference. Is there another reference? Oh, okay, sure. Okay, I'll take the Matthew 3, 7 and up. No worries. Let's go to 1 Peter 2.25. 1 Peter 2.25. It says, For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Um, connect pretty well? think it's enough for us to at least warrant you know more more study right so is there another reference off of this one second level reference okay Ezekiel 37 you said no 34 7 and Hebrews what Okay. Is there anyone else that has maybe one more? Okay. We'll stop there. And again, you can be writing a lot of these down to see what they what they're saying. You can keep building this list. So let's just go to a couple of these three and we'll stop there. So Ezekiel, I already know Ezekiel thirty four connects. Because that's one of my favorite passages. Ezekiel 34, verse 7. And I'm going to go on because you'll see. It says, Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, because my flock lacks a shepherd and has so been plundered and has become food for all the wild animals and because my shepherds did not search for my flock but cared for themselves rather than for my flock therefore shepherds hear the word of the Lord this is what the sovereign Lord says I am against the shepherds and will hold them accountable a little bit later let me jump down verse 11 for this is what the sovereign Lord says I myself will search for my sheep and look after them so a prophecy here in Ezekiel 34 is saying that the shepherds of Israel, the religious leaders of Israel, were not taking care of God's sheep or God's people. And so God says, I myself am going to come down and watch after them myself. So that connects directly to, uh, to Luke chapter 15, verse 4. And from there, if I looked at um, verse 11, my... We're not going to look this one up for now, but my study Bible says to next go look at Psalm 119, verse 176. So I could connect another passage to this. If we looked at Hebrew, Hebrews 13, 20. I'm going to go through a little bit quick since I'm holding you too long. 13, 20 says, May the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. Okay? So that one's talking about Jesus being that great shepherd that goes and finds the lost. And again, if I would look at 13 verse 20, this one tells me to um, go to, I'll pick John 10, 11. Okay, yeah, they, that's one of the other ones that it told me to go to as well. And then Isaiah 
53, 5. 53, 6? Sure. So Isaiah 53, 6 says, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then another place that this one tells me to go would be uh, John, let's just pick three, verse, I think it's seven, 17. That one has another like 10 verses I could go to. All I'm hoping that you see from this exercise is that when you start with your verse and you want to really dig into the Bible and you want to understand how the Bible teaches uh, itself to you, you can start with a verse, and you can start using a study Bible to look up cross-references and decide whether or not those cross-references definitely um, pertain to what you're studying. And then you can look at their cross-references, and you can look at their cross-references, and you can keep going and really dig into a passage and have a real understanding of how we are considered to be sheep, how Jesus is our shepherd, uh, and so on and so forth. That is one of the tools that a study Bible can equip you with, okay? And again, as you're studying, as you're becoming more familiar with the Bible, and the reason I chose Luke 15 is because um, I did a sermon on it last year, and you'll hear something pretty similar to it uh, this coming week, um, but I already knew about a few of these of these passages that as I read the passage, I'm like, oh, yeah, that says the same thing in Ezekiel 34, and I can go read that. And I'm like, and it says the same thing in Isaiah 53, 5, and I can go read that. So pretty soon, your own, pretty soon, your own memory will help be your own almost cross-reference. Uh, we're going to go through the next little bit real quick. Um, I only got like a couple slides left. Uh, the role of the Bible in the New Testament. First, no one was debating that scripture came from God, it was an assumed fact. They used this scripture, uh, which was the Old Testament, to look for how God revealed and pointed to Jesus. And God used Paul and others to expand the Old Testament with the Gospels and the letters and so on and so forth. Uh, the church understood scripture through self-revelation -re uh, they saw that God wrote some scripture. God uh, dictated some scripture. He said, write this down. Uh, the Old Testament prophets spoke of Jesus. Jesus said that he satisfies and supersedes er some earlier scripture. And scripture is an important teacher as the inspired word of God. So if you ever walk away from... Uh, just talking with me and not having the understanding that you should be in the Bible, I haven't done my job. I hope that this helps us understand we should be in the Bible because it is God's word. And finally, the Bible is revelation. The Bible is authoritative. The Bible is truth. The Bible will provide all that is necessary for the man or woman of God to know about Christ, to know about salvation, to know about so many things. And all these things you can see on pages 58 to 59 of your handout. And they're derived from scripture. All right, for next time, I have uh, the last handout for this section of uh, the Equip Seminar. Can I help? Sure. If uh, you've lost earlier sections, let me know. I have extras. So just read through that handout. And, it, you know, there's a lot of information in there, so, you know, at least peruse it. And then here's my contact info if you need it. So that's all for tonight. And yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. Then I went to another version, you know, Yeah. Yep. 
Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's these study Bibles and things, they're not exhaustive tools for sure. Even when Strong's, I have the Strong's Concordance and it says the exhaustive concordance, but it's only like this thick. I'm like, I don't know that you can be <laughs> exhaustive. Yeah. Yeah, so many, yep. Yeah, Trish was just sharing that uh, the word shepherd, she had one Bible that had a list of them, and then she went to another Bible and it had a different list of them, and she's like, it's just, you know, there's so many. So, yeah, I encourage, this is a tool, but it's, again, it's not an exhaustive tool either. It's not a Swiss Army knife. <laughs> All right, y'all have a good night.